This is episode 625 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Guessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, uh, it's easy to do show prep these days. Sometimes the uh, dog days of summer get a little tricky because uh, there's not much going on. Now, obviously, this is an election year, and uh, there is plenty, more than plenty. We're, we're just having mind-blowing uh, moves of historical significance every single week at the national level, and even some big stuff at the state level. But uh, uh, the latest, of course, is that uh, Joe Biden has dropped out of the presidential race over the weekend. Uh, because this is such an important issue, we uh, have our questions uh, to ask of people and, uh, generally speaking, the situation. But I'll start with this. Uh, Kamala Harris uh, looks to have locked up enough delegates to go ahead and uh, run for the presidency, uh, but Joe Biden has not been seen. Yes, he had COVID, but even his statement was just a screenshot of a written letter, uh, we have no evidence to this date, uh, you know, five, six days at this point that Biden agreed to this willingly, that he uh, is healthy, that he's okay. Uh, it's it's a crazy situation in this country right now. Yes, it is uh, more than a little concerning. I saw a news report this morning that said uh, the president is expected to be back in the White House this afternoon at 2.30, and we will see. Maybe there will be a sighting of him at that point. But, yes, a lot has gone on, uh, you know, starting with Trump. Now we have a new Democratic, uh, I don't even know what you call it, the apparent nominee. Is that the right word? Uh, and it is uh, one of the things, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is that uh, it was... Uh, Pretty amazing the speed with which out with the old and in with the new was seemingly solidified on the uh, Democratic Party. Yeah, well, uh, I guess we'll start with this. Uh, Senator Heinrich and Rep. Uh, Vasquez, both before the weekend, uh, had officially stated that they wanted to see Joe Biden step aside. Uh, so that was, I don't know, maybe Wednesday or Thursday of last week. Uh, it's important to note because they were among the earlier uh, public statement uh, signers or pub people putting out public statements in Congress saying that they wanted Biden to go. They're, of course, in re relatively competitive races. Uh, then Biden said that in an interview that he uh, might resign if he had a health issue. Then he came down with COVID-19, uh, despite being vaxxed however infinite number of times that he's received the vaccine. Uh, and really, uh, aside from those statements and some tweets, uh, which obviously he's not running the Twitter account, uh, they were tweeting during the debate, for example, uh, he has not said anything publicly. Uh, so it is uh, quite odd. Uh, I will run through a few questions that we have. Um, first and foremost, uh, if he's unfit to run for office, is he really fit to be president for the next six months through January of 2025? Uh, of course, uh, we know Kamala Harris is very likely to be the uh, presidential candidate on the Democratic side. Uh, she will rise to that position without ever having a having won a single primary uh, delegate in either the last presidential election, which she ran in and uh, exited early, or in this race, um, so avoiding the entire primary process, uh, who will the VP candidate be? I think uh, Mark Kelly from Arizona is one. Uh, there are others, Whitmer from Michigan. Uh, Pennsylvania is uh, Shapiro, the governor over there. Uh, you know, I, I, some are saying Michelle Lujan Grisham is an outside uh opportunity i i truly doubt it but at this point it's wide open and it's really oh yeah she's 
truly an outside candidate, probably, yeah. uh, as are you and I. Yeah, we're on the <laughs> list of people who are on earth who uh, well, actually were Americans above the age necessary to right, be right. Uh, a vice president. So Right. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, will Donald Trump debate Kamala Harris? Should he decide to? Uh, should Harris be considered a legitimate candidate, uh, especially at this point uh, where she hasn't won any any uh, delegates? Uh, that is the process that we have in this country with both parties. Uh, we're not doing the smoke-filled room thing at the conventions, which used to be done. And, you know, having an open convention would have been at least a, a process. Uh, there's no real process in place here. Uh, and, you know, I, I can only imagine how this would be received by the media if Trump bowed out of the race at the last minute to only to be replaced by another Republican candidate running for president. Uh, the media, by and large, are rallying around Kamala Harris for being unique and uh, all these specific things. Uh, but the, the, I just can't see how there would not be outrage and Republicans would be in serious trouble for doing similar uh, similar tactics. But you know, will will this be something? Whereas, if the elected uh, or or the the person successful in the most primary votes uh, doesn't perform well uh, in the polls as you approach an election, you just get the hook out and uh, and take them out. Uh, there's a lot of questions that are uh, being asked. Uh, these are some of them, but uh, I don't know many answers out there for, for any of them at this point. No, I, and neither do I, Paul. And, you know, it's amazing the uh, the political parties control that process. Uh, and it is very interesting. Uh, the Democrats are, you know, one of their mantras is that uh, if Trump wins, uh, it'll be the end of our democracy. Well, right. it sure doesn't seem very democratic the way they select their presidential candidate the, the last couple of times. And, uh, Paul, I saw an interesting note from uh, Maggie Luis Oliver, the uh, New Mexico Secretary of State, warning against misinformation about the uh, process by which Democrats select their presidential candidate. And uh, believe me, I'm interested in that because uh, it seems like the rules are at a minimum, uh, what shall we say, malleable and yeah. flexible to the situation. It doesn't seem like, you know, we elect in there and, you know, then they've had the thing about super delegates in the past and there's a whole lot of things going forward. But uh, my recollection is uh, Kamala got 1.4% of the vote uh, when she was allowed uh, to be on the ballot, you know, for... Uh, becoming the candidate and now here she is uh it's a uh, nice work if you can get it and uh we will see what happens but uh to your first initial question is yes if the president w isn't competent to run for president is he competent to be president and it's not like uh this issue hasn't been contemplated with uh the 25th amendment but th i don't hear any talk about that at this point yeah um I, and I'll just say that Kamala Harris, uh, while she's relatively low profile, I mean, she is a vice president. She'll, uh, you know, she served for uh, a, a decent amount of time here with Joe Biden. Uh, a lot of people haven't familiarized themselves with her. She has a, a very off-putting uh, personality, I think it's safe to say, her cackling laugh and just at inopportune times. She said she wants to ban fracking. Uh, she is the border czar for uh, the Biden administration, which of course, uh, that just is a softball over the plate for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, you know, just a lot of significant issues. She's uh, not exactly earned her way to the top in many respects. Uh, of course, the history with Willie Brown, the powerful speaker of the House in, in uh, San Francisco and California, uh, that she's widely known to have uh, risen to the top, uh, not not via her merits, we'll just uh, say that. But uh, there, there's a lot of things that are going to come out about Kamala Harris that I think will uh, give people a very um, strong reason to have a, a second thought about her. And you're, you're never going to turn those diehard uh, Democrats uh, who will vote for anybody. Uh, but I do think that Kamala Harris could 
there, there is a chance that she could be even worse electorally than Joe Biden. And I think uh, it's going to be a counterfactual that we'll never know the answer to. Uh, but the reason that Joe Biden got to be president in the first place is because Bernie Sanders was on the verge of winning the Democratic primary nearly four years ago, or really four years ago. And uh, the Democratic establishment did, did not want a self-described socialist to win. Of course, Bernie Sanders lasted a heck of a lot longer in that process than Kamala Harris did. Uh, so you know, Biden, I, I think there were certainly rumors about his mental faculties even back then. Those were exposed uh, fully. Uh, and now uh, Kamala Harris has managed to uh, rise to the top. But it is... Uh, it's going to be a heck of a next few months, um, and we'll just see where this whole process takes us. But um, well, and Paul, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Paul, to your point, you know, it wasn't that many months ago when Biden was appearing a, a little better than he has recently. That uh, well, Biden Biden is more electable than Kamala. So as as much as uh, as much as it seems like everyone knew the, all the insiders knew the media knew, you know, it was interesting how uh, the talking points uh, just a couple short weeks ago is uh, I've never seen him sharper. He's on top of things. Uh, he's, he's the guy, you know, nothing gets by him to, he's got to go, you know, it just uh, turned on a dime. Well, I'm back in the uh, Biden is competent era. A few short weeks ago is that, Kamala is not electable. She's not popular. And now they've just flipped both of those. And so uh, she's almost had a media and a party coronation, and she's riding high right now. But the fact is she needs to run for president. Or uh, is it the situation where she may run almost a Biden-like campaign from uh, during the COVID era, just uh, stay at home and not talk to anybody and figure uh that uh, she's at as strong a position as she could now, and to get out and have people know her would only make it worse. Uh, I don't think that would happen, but, uh, you know, as I say, she was viewed to be much worse than Biden in just till a few short weeks ago. Yeah, and uh, for good reason as well. Well, uh, we'll get back to national issues in a moment, but uh, uh, we had a special session here in New Mexico, and I would say that... Uh, the results of that are in many ways equally intriguing and uh, interesting as they were in, in Washington. Obviously not the kind of national attention uh, that's been poured on uh, the presidential race. But uh, on Thursday, Michelle Lujan Grisham, uh, I couldn't make it up uh, for the one-day special session. I was in Clovis or traveling to Cl Clovis, New Mexico to do a talk and have a, a few meetings out there. Uh, so I missed out on the fun and games and uh, was planning to go up on Friday, uh, but they didn't have. It's uh, the party that was canceled. So uh, let's say this. Uh, regardless of whether you think that the governor's crime ideas were the greatest thing since sliced bread or uh, just warmed over and non-effective, and I think it's safe to say that uh, when I talked to Representative Montoya, the minority leader of the Republicans in the House, he kind of uh, led towards the more uh, ineffective side of things, but uh, they did get a sponsor. The only sponsor they could get for a lot of these priorities was uh, Senator Mark Moores, a Republican uh, departing yeah, from the lame legislature. Duck uh, the yeah, uh, somebody who's you know always, in my estimation, been a conservative, certainly on fiscal issues. One could talk about other things, and I, I'm not going to get into that, but on a dollars and cents regulatory kind of uh, perspective, Mark Moores will be missed in Santa Fe. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the governor is the one that's making the headlines because uh, her statement uh, to say that she is a little bit miffed by the Democrats is maybe a, a vast understatement, but I'll read this paragraph. Uh, the legislature, this is from MLG's statement, Post session, the legislature just demonstrated that it has no interest in making New Mexico safer. Not one public safety measure was considered, not one despite the bills having the backing of police chiefs, public safety unions, mayors, prosecutors, businesses, tribal leaders, crime victims, and others who have seen firsthand the erosion of public safety that has deeply damaged the quality of life in our state. Uh, she continued 
saying that uh, uh, she believed that uh, the majority of Republicans would have passed many or all of these bills, but they were blocked. So uh, the governor is making it very clear who she blames for the failure of the special session. Uh, you know, I think it's safe to say that looking at this from maybe a more objective perspective, the governor uh, mishandled the situation for six years, and it's kind of odd to come at this from a special session standpoint, but uh, it is gratifying to see finally uh, the blame being put on the progressives in the legislature who, without a doubt, put uh, a stop to any Republican anti-crime bills for six years, and the governor was silent, not only silent, but as we saw, said last week, uh, has been out there electing progressive legislators in Democratic primaries to make the legislature even more left-wing on crime issues. So it's, it's just baffling, the whole thing. No, the whole thing is very baffling. And Paul, um, you know, we've talked about the in, outsized influence of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party that until this session, uh, our, the New Mexico governor was well aligned with. But I do have a feeling, you know, you look at all the progressive groups that said no we don't want, you know, any new crime things because of all of their assorted uh, difficult to follow yet strongly believed reasons. But I do think that if you look at uh, who's been successful in get out the vote campaigns, it's the progressive wing of the Democrat Party has done very well in New Mexico. And I think uh, most of the Democrats said we don't want to go against them. We don't want to have a... Uh, a black mark on our progressive record going into the general election when uh, some of us have uh, some of us have elections. So that is one theory. Again, uh, not necessarily proven, but the other is that uh, maybe the legislature and again uh, the Democrats, uh, not the Republicans. The Republicans haven't been able to bristle. They haven't been able to get much done in the entire Michelle Lujan Grisham uh, administration. But maybe the uh, the D's, no matter their uh, stripe, just got tired of being dictated to by the governor, and they were going to send her a strong message that there indeed is another branch of government in New Mexico, and she is not in charge of it. So maybe some combination of that, maybe something else. But uh, it's interesting to note that they didn't just do the signy die, you know, log in and log out mm -hmm. sort of thing, but they did some, you know, not. Un, not unmeaningful kind of spending that had to do with the uh, Rio Doso fires and some stopgap measures because the federal government's so slow getting aid. But it's interesting that they put that in the feed bill, the bill that pays their per diem and et cetera, that if they wouldn't have done that, uh, I think they were concerned that maybe the governor would uh, veto that and they wouldn't get their per diem and their, uh, mileage to come up to Santa Fe for the day, and uh, as of uh, as of this morning, I don't know. I don't believe that bill has been, you know, the feed bill has been signed to the best of my knowledge. So, uh, will she veto? Is there a veto in the works? Are these poor, destitute, unpaid legislators going to be out their uh, gas, motel, and meal money? Uh, you know, these are uh, these are what passes for important questions here in New Mexico politics. So that that was one I hadn't thought of. Uh, excellent angle. That's why that's why we uh, bring you in for the high level analysis there Wally. I'm uh, that's going to be interesting to watch. Uh, speaking of high level analysis, John Trevor the uh, Albuquerque Journal cartoonist hit the nail on the head yet again. Uh, took a picture of it and put it up on my uh, Twitter account. Uh, it's a picture of the front door, theoretically, of the roundhouse. Uh, legislature, criminal justice session, a bunch of donkeys lined up, ready to go into the building through a revolving door. Uh, and then they are coming out the other side of the same revolving door, a couple of security guards saying, there they go, right back out on the street. Guess they figured they won't face any consequences. And uh, the kind of tagline is yet another revolving door. Now, obviously, there is a, a revolving door for the criminals, and uh, in this case, the revolving door worked for the legislators. Uh, will there be any consequences? Well, we're past the primary uh, election as a 
consequence, uh, as we just said, uh, the progressives took even more uh, ground within the Democratic Party. Uh, will there be consequences this fall? Uh, that is a very open question with all the chaos at the national level in the presidential race. It is impossible to say uh, where things will wind up. But uh, boy, what a what a mess! And uh, you know, the governor uh, is in many ways a lame duck. I suspect that uh, they will still be eye to eye and united on easy easy issues like spending lots of money, corporate welfare for preferred uh, businesses that they theoretically want to attract, uh, film subsidies and the like. Uh, no accountability for anybody, including uh, education, crime, exactly. you know, uh, yeah. accountability, no accountability. Uh, paid family leave. Uh, I, I still think that unless the Republicans make inroads in the November election that we'll see that pass. So uh, I, I Nothing, nothing uh, papers over uh, hurt egos more than spending lots of uh, other people's money. I found that out. Yes. And, you know, it will be interesting uh, to see what the governor's power is to do things. You know, we've, uh, I think, uh, we talked a little bit, I talked a little bit last week about uh, Governor Gary Johnson being the uh, veto vato. He would, uh, he would veto lots of bills and there were enough Republicans to, uh, block an override of his vetoes. And so that was his tool. Well, you know, she's starting out with a, uh, she's starting out with a lot of Democrats in the legislature. If she vetoes a lot of their uh, spending bills or their pork barrel or whatever, they, they are mighty close to the point uh, of being able to override both of those vetoes with a few, if any uh, Republican supporters. So, you know, yeah, the, it is, I think we're in a little bit of uncharted territory. Not that, uh, not that we haven't had governors of the Democratic Party be in disagreement with the legislature, but it, it hasn't been as much of a whipsaw as this one from everybody on the same page to now neither side, not even close, not even in the same book. Yeah. Um, on the uh, fires, uh, specifically down in Rio Doso, uh, the Albuquerque Journal and other media outlets have reported that a couple uh, is suspected of setting the salt fire and several others on the Me Mescalero uh, Reservation, the Apache uh, Mescalero Reservation, uh, according to the FBI. Uh, the salt fire torched 7,000 acres around Rio Doso, and there were more than a dozen smaller forest fires set in the surrounding area. Now, these people have not been formally uh, charged, but there does appear to be grounds for at least some of the fires uh, down in Rio Doso being uh, set by humans, which is obviously uh, really troubling and something that uh, uh, I, don't, I don't really know. I don't know how you can prevent this kind of... Uh, in, it's kind of like the... Uh, environmental equivalent of a mass shooting kind of you it's very very hard to prevent this kind of uh of willful act of uh not negligence but uh just uh lack of yeah, care for yeah, humanity yeah destruction and uh wanton destruction mm -hmm. and when the four you know in new mexico this is not a new thing that we have a, a forest fire season but you know with the forest being drier uh, coming out of our hundred years of forest management shame where we ne never let any fires burn. It just does not take that much at the right period of time. And you get somebody who no matter what their, you know, what their uh, psychological diagnosis is, whether they're pyromaniac, uh, whether they are, you know, have some other uh, mental disorder or just out and out criminal doesn't take much, you know, a, a few matches, a, a five, five pound container of propane, you know, you could do a lot of damage, uh, in a short period of time. And it reminds me uh, a few years ago in the Bosque of Albuquerque, they have, uh, they had a lot of fires that were set and, uh, the people who were doing that, guess what they knew, they knew when it was the driest, 
Uh, and they would also uh, knew back then they used to do more helicopter uh, kind of suppression at night, but they quit that. And so they'd start them right at dusk, right as the sun went down. So it's not like they're not intelligent in terms of knowing when the most damaging time to do it is. But what do you do? think you have as good a forest management as possible and heaven forbid we might need to thin trees even quicker but as we said nobody is uh the new mexico poster child for having done a good job was the mescalero apache Mm -hmm. Uh, they've done so much believe me they beat the forest service you know by uh by a uh, factor of 10 times better and still in a dry conditions with somebody setting a fire you can't do anything about it yeah, and uh, of course, deeply tragic for people all across that area of our state, the Rio Doso area. Um, moving on to a report from uh, learner.com. Uh, it's a legit website. I uh, looked through their uh, rankings and other information available on their website. Uh, it's a education data-oriented site, and they have something out that I thought was very interesting. They looked at education spending by state, but they added in higher education and uh, uh, factored in, you know, all the taxpayer dollars that are spent for uh, all levels of education. I think this holistic approach is actually quite a good one because it is certainly the policy of the state of New Mexico uh, to encourage uh, people at all levels, academically to go to college. Uh, We're now doing free college, so that means the spending is further up. But uh, overall, New Mexico came in as the fourth ranked state for spending the most on education per student. Uh, Alaska, Michigan, and Hawaii were the three states that outweighed New Mexico, but a total spend per student of 45,717. Now, I'm absolutely positive because we've done some research on this that part of the challenge is that the K-12 system doesn't get the job done. Therefore, uh, a lot of these college students are taking extra time doing remedial coursework in uh, their first year or two of college. And, uh, and that is adding to the expense, of course, once the taxpayers are paying the bill, uh, you're also getting more expenses uh, piled up there. But uh, uh, fourth most spending on education ov- overall or holistically speaking. Uh, what are we getting for that? I don't think the uh, <laughs> the answer is very good in terms of what we what we're receiving. Well, yes, no doubt. And then you know uh, the it's not the resources in; it's what's being done with them that is the issue. We've said that, but uh, it's getting hard to run away from that. More and more groups uh, coming out with reports uh, like this that don't always make that uh, point as directly. But even, you know, the Legislative Finance Committee is starting to say, hmm, maybe we're not doing things quite right because uh, we keep spending more money and the results uh, don't get any better, at least relative to uh, the other 49 states in the union. And Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia when they're putting the re- in those reports. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, again, you can check that out and links to the report uh, at errorsofenchantment.com. Uh, moving a little bit back to the federal level, I had a recent post uh, about make firing government employees common again. And uh, this is kind of in the wake mostly of the uh, assassination attempt on Donald Trump, uh, especially the poor uh, response, the overall lack of competence exhibited by the Secret Service. I think if you'd asked day before the uh, Donald Trump assassination attempt, uh, which entities within the government are the most competent, I think the Secret Service probably would have come up as one of the most respected. Uh, That is uh, no longer the case. Uh, The good news, I guess, uh, since I wrote this originally, uh, Director Kimberly Cheadle uh, has resigned. Uh, She had a very uh, troubling hearing before the House of Representatives yesterday in which she uh, did not 
respond to many questions. Uh, of course, it's not just uh, this incident and this incompetence that needs to be held uh, to account. There was the Afghanistan withdrawal during the Biden administration, COVID policy, uh, while Trump didn't have as much time to uh, change uh, the way that was uh, handled, uh, certainly his adherence to Dr. Fauci's pronouncements uh, did not help Trump go in the right direction when it came to COVID. Biden even more so uh, as he stuck with restrictions and poor COVID policies throughout the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, especially those that hurt children, kept them out of school. Uh, there, there's just so many examples of government officials being incompetent. And we could look right here in New Mexico, uh, same thing, covid uh, policies that kept New Mexico children out of school had devastating impacts on their educational outcomes and social outcomes, uh, putting us at 52nd nationally and uh, the nation's report card. Uh, again, nobody gets fired for these things, and Democrats in Washington are trying to make it more difficult for uh, potentially Donald Trump as president to get rid of incompetent uh, government employees. So, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not saying Kimberly Cheadle's a uh, a step in the right direction, but it, it's something at least. Yes, and you know it's one of those things. Uh, I have worked uh, not in a government organization, but I have worked in an organization where uh, terminations were all but uh, all but impossible to do. And so, uh, what happens is that if somebody does a bad enough job or they're incompetent enough, you just try to find them another job and another agency. And it seems like that's about the worst that ever happens uh, with the federal bureaucracy right now. And again, not, uh, I'm not hard hearted person. You know, I don't believe there should be indiscriminate firings of people, but you know, there it's gotten to the point where um, there are just, when you have a bureaucracy the size of the federal government and the number of people who lose their job, uh, who lose their jobs, uh, is such a small fraction of a percent on an annual basis. It just, uh, it's just not credible that they're doing a good job of, uh, keeping the best and the brightest going and motivated and working and, uh, getting rid of those who are just in the way or not doing anything or in many cases making it worse. Yeah, and uh, it is worth noting that during their debate, uh, which seems like eons ago at this point, uh, President Trump did uh, call Joe Biden out for being unwilling or lacking in the uh, backbone to fire uh, people who, specifically on the Afghanistan withdrawal, but in general, that was a criticism. Of course, Donald Trump made his, uh, you know, he was a well-known figure before that, but one of his most famous uh, lines on television was you're fired. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, something that needs to be brought back uh, to government across the board. Uh, moving along the uh, kids count report, we've talked about it, but I do want to uh, just make sure folks are aware. I had a opinion piece that was uh, run across the state, uh, and uh, right now it was in the Sunday Albuquerque Journal, uh, just highlighting the way in which uh, we're spending a lot of money. Uh, we have a lot of money to spend, uh, but we're not moving the needle on the kids count report, and I go into all the gory details. But ultimately, uh, as we are wont to do, uh, we call for policy changes, and uh, school choice is the simplest thing to do to bring uh, our education system up. Maybe not the simplest, but it's the it's, it's probably the most fundamental change and the most basic. Of course, Mississippi model and uh, driving reading results uh, higher would be another way to approach that. And then, of course, uh, we have this largesse from the oil and gas industry that uh, has not done anything of note to make New Mexico uh, a better and more prosperous state. So uh, thanks to the mismanagement and incompetence of uh, of Michelle Lujan Grisham and the legislature. So uh, certainly using the left's data 
to make the case that if we want to improve outcomes in New Mexico across the board, uh, limited government, individual responsibility, encouraging people to get jobs, not sit on welfare, uh, lowering taxes, reducing regulations, school choice, uh, other accountability measures, uh, that's the way to go, not just, oh, we got a lot of money. Let's, uh, A, throw it at government programs, and B, save it in government accounts. Yeah, and Paul, it's interesting to note that there are places around New Mexico where the public schools uh, perform better than, say, they do in the Albuquerque public schools and certain others, and they actually uh, have less uh, charter schools and other alternative to the uh, government schools. But, you know, to your point about uh, why school choice is a good way to do it, uh, you know, there's this... uh, concept of the self-reforming bureaucracy that the bureaucracy can write itself and uh it's it it is a it's a joke it's an oxymoron and we've gotten to the point where uh you know the public schools they need a little they need a little pressure and uh you know one of the statistics about why school choice is so effective is it not only helps the uh schools that are formed uh, the alternative charter schools and the like uh, the actual public schools have some incentives to actually get better, and they tend to do a little bit better job as well. So is it the, you know, in a perfect world, things would be working so well that the uh, government uh, monopoly schools would be doing great and we wouldn't have a problem. But guess what? That's not the situation we face. And so, yeah, it's a uh, very good way to do it. And uh, it is interesting when uh, Susana Martinez proposed uh some very, uh, at the time, uh, controversial education reforms, how bad uh, the other side fought against those and made lots of excuses. Well, now they're, they don't make res- excuses for the policy. They make excuses for the lack of performance. We're, we're, we're the worst in the country, but we're a little better than we were. That's about uh, all I've heard with the recent uh, reports on educational attainment in New Mexico. And so hopefully something will change because, man, you know, we have this whole thing where there's a, there's a case to provide uh, more funding for Native American and other disadvantaged uh, communities, but the money is not making the difference. No doubt. All right. Well, speaking of uh, policies that uh, aren't going to do a darn bit of good for anybody, uh, According to the LA Times, statewide electric vehicle sales growth saw a drop in California, uh, and not just uh, growth being dropped, but according to this article, uh, California saw a overall decline in EV sales uh, between the second quarter of 2023 and the second quarter of 2024. Uh, 102,730 were sold in the second quarter of 2023. 101,443 were registered in the state in 2024 in the second quarter. So uh, this is concerning for those like our governor and others who are headlong uh, demanding electric vehicles and putting up subsidies and other mandates to force EVs into the marketplace, into an unwilling consumer market. Uh, Gavin Newsom, of course, is going all the way to uh, abolishing the internal combustion engine by 2035. At least that's the plan, stated plan. Uh, Lujan Grisham is only going to 82% by 2032, which is uh, problematic and radical enough and simply will not happen Uh, but we're, of course, less than two years out from 43% mandate. Uh, New Mexico is not nearly as far down the path of EV uh, adoption, EV mandates as California, But and and nor do we have the deployment of the uh, charging stations as they do out in California. But uh, if California sneezes, I would say New Mexico uh, EV owners are going to catch the flu. So uh, th- this is not good news on top of other bad news for the EV push. Yeah, and that uh, if they sneeze, uh, we get the cold. That's not necessarily by the driving public, but by the uh, the governmental entities that are forcing all this down. And uh, yeah, EVs are EVs are struggling. You know, uh, 
there's a number of factors. I was reading a, a Goldman Sachs report, and it's like uh, they don't make as much money because capital costs are high, you know, in the in the auto industry. And then uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around what the government policy is going to be. We have these strong... Uh, we have these strong mandates in places like California, New Mexico signs on, but other states don't do it. And finally, those charging stations, boy, we sure do a lot of press releases and allocate a lot of money to them. But uh, in places like New Mexico, and really it sounds like most of the rest of the country, the numbers of uh, fast charging stations that actually get built and run and operate uh, uh, appropriately to charge vehicles is really at a extremely no, low number for this uh, at this point in the in the rollout of this quote the industry to end all industries here in the United States. Yeah. Um, finally, we will uh, briefly touch on the fact that Argentina has moved out of a recession uh, for the first time in uh, in years. So Argentina is. You know, economically under a uh, libertarian or free market conservative, I don't think it really matters, and I don't think it necessarily directly applies to uh, you know Argentine politics. Uh, you know, calling him the next or the Argentine Trump. I mean, maybe his kind of approach to politics. But uh, Argentina was announced; uh, they had managed to uh, get out of. A, a recession, uh, which means a shrinking economy, uh, and that's that's tricky because it took a lot of effort to get inflation down, and then on the other hand, to bring economic growth to the uh, to the nation of Argentina. So uh, Malay and his free market principles uh, are seemingly succeeded succeeding uh, in going that direction. I think. Uh, while I wouldn't call Trump the Argentine, uh, the equivalent of the Argentine uh, Malay, I would love to see Trump, if he were to become president, move in a more market-based direction, uh, get get a little more concerned about reducing the size of government and uh, embracing those free market reforms. But uh, things continue apace. They seem to be working in the nation of Argentina. Yeah, and Paul, it was uh, over the past several years, uh, Argentina was one of those places that people are saying it's hopeless. They can never recover. And to just have a few better policies and a uh, implement some market reforms in just uh, a few short months have things uh, go much better is uh, really uh, an impressive, impressive accomplishment. And dare I say, uh, is it appropriate to say, don't cry for me, Argentina is the new... Uh, watchword when it comes to their economy, when it, which for the past many, many years, it's just been abysmal there. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, been abysmal for uh, many years. Uh, Argentina was a wealthy nation at uh, the start of the 20th century, so 1900 for those of you who don't know how that all works. But uh, uh, yeah, in 1900, it was a very wealthy nation. It uh, has been uh, devastated by socialist policies. And uh, you know we've never gone quite down that that path uh, in the United States to the same extent, but uh, we had uh, we have an opportunity to, I think, if Trump were to be elected, possibly uh, he he could move uh, in ways that are serious about economic reforms, uh, like Malay has problems not so dire as Argentina's, but. Uh, that's the time to act. I know that's uh, counterintuitive. We've got a lot of problems economically building in the United States. All right. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.